so I was going to start out uh, uh, giving you guys an update on uh, ILD and trying to make sense of the alphabet soup that some of you may remember from uh, medical training. But I just got back from the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation um, Summit this weekend. Um, and as it turns out, it's more alphabet soup than ever, and I can't make sense of it for you. So instead, what I thought I would do is give you a little bit of a look into the future of IPF. Because there are a lot of really new and exciting things happening in this space, um, and there was a lot of interesting data presented this weekend, and so I'll um, show you some of that uh, now. And there are a lot of things on my to-do list for today. So um, the first thing on it is my disclosures. Um, and I'm not going to be discussing any off-label usage today. And just a quick um, review, what is IPF? Um, so IPF is a chronic progressing scarring disease of the lungs. Uh, we think of it as a lung limited disease as opposed to those interstitial lung diseases that have more systemic uh, manifestations such as autoimmune lung disease and so on. Um, it's uh, probably, although we call it idiopathic, a common injury pathway that uh, occurs in a predisposed individual. Um, we good? You guys can see everything? Um, yeah? Okay, uh, <laughs> and uh, manifest after some additional injury. Um, the, uh, so it's a disease I tell uh, when I talk to students, it's a disease of old white dudes primarily, so more common in men, Caucasian men in particular, and older Caucasian men for sure, um, but uh, can happen in younger, um, younger patients as well as women. This is a cartoon of uh, the, essentially the disease progression and natural history of IPF um, uh, from the ATS guidelines in 2011. The um, minority of patients will have sort of a slow, but st uh, slow progression. Uh, you could even imagine that these people might be stable over time. Uh, there uh, is a minority of people who will rapidly fall off the cliff and loss of lung function. And then the majority of people have this slow but relentlessly progressive disease. And all of that can be punctuated at any point by episodes of acute respiratory worsening um, from multiple etiologies, but when those are idiopathic, we tend to call them uh, acute exacerbations of IPF. So what is UIP? If you take um, nothing away from this talk, uh, uh, IPF uh, does equal UIP or usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, but it is not vice versa, and not all ILD is IPF, okay? So remember that, those of you who write notes about my patients. Um, usual interstitial pneumonia is actually a very specific pattern of uh, chronic fibrosing lung injury that can be seen radiographically in high-resolution CT and also under the microscope on uh, various types of lung biopsies. Now, it can be seen in multiple clinical scenarios. For example, rheumatoid arthritis lung disease is uh, frequently associated with uh, a UIP pattern, uh, but when it is idiopathic, it uh, clinically is, um, is uh, called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And these are just gross specimens for comparison. Okay, so you can imagine that, uh, that this is a, a normal, uh, normal lung, and then this is, oh, you know, for, except for the fact that it's not in a human, um, and then this is a, a lung with a usual interstitial pneumonia pattern uh, from an IPF patient. Now compare this gross specimen to a high resolution CT and you can see where these honeycomb uh, cysts come from. So this is a feature of definite usual interstitial pneumonia radiographically and you can see that in the gross specimen. So this is visible to the naked eye. There, uh, another feature here is traction bronchiectasis, this is a feature of chronic scarring. Uh, this is more honeycomb change and some coarse articulation. And this is normal lung pathologically compared with uh, uh, fibrotic pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia for under the microscope. So all of this uh, pink here is some uh, dense uh, fibrosis. We have uh, temporal heterogeneity is a key word we use here. So we see um, old fibrosis, new fibrosis, which is fibroblastic foci, and, um, and uh, preserved alveoli in the same specimen. So remember what I told you, not all ILD is IPF, and most of what we're talking about today is going to refer to IPF. This concept is important in the fact that since the last time I spoke to this group, there are two um, new, relatively newly approved uh, antifibrotic therapies that were approved by the FDA in October of 2014 and have become part of the standard of care for therapy for patients with IPF, um, not, for, not currently for other forms of interstitial lung disease. <coughs> 
This is uh, a graph from the um, impulses studies of nintedinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, um, and shows uh, slowing of disease progression on nintedinib versus placebo in two concurrently run studies. And um, this is from the ASCEND study, which is a third phase three study of perfenidone in IPF, showing a similar um, slowing of disease progression when it comes to the forest vital capacity, and this led to the approval of both therapies. So now I um, am going to switch gears, and this is sort of moving from uh, the, past, the current state and past to uh, what does the future hold uh, in IPF. So first I want to take a look at some of the ways that we may be diagnosing IPF in the uh, not so distant future. This is our basic diagnostic algorithm from the 2011 ATS guidelines um, on IPF. And this has high resolution CT as the linchpin in diagnosis for the majority of patients, or up to 50% of those who have a definite usual interstitial pneumonia pattern on their high resolution CT scan. And they don't, these patients, uh, if they have that, no, no identifiable, identifiable cause for their interstitial lung disease, then that clinically correlates with a diagnosis of IPF. Um, contrast that with those patients who don't have all of the definite features of usual interstitial pneumonia on their CT scan, and those patients are required by these guidelines to have a surgical lung biopsy for diagnosis. Um, now, uh, uh, so 50% uh, of patients are subject to that. Uh, and now here's the current radiographic definition of UIP. And the difference between this definite UIP pattern, which leads you to no surgical lung biopsy, and a possible UIP pattern, which requires a lung biopsy, is the, is the presence or, um, or absence of honeycomb change, which we saw in the radiographs. Um, the, and both of these are absent, all of these features that are inconsistent with the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. Now these guidelines are very common in terms of inclusion criteria for clinical trials and we utilize them clinically to make the diagnosis of IPF. However, the impulsive studies, uh, which I showed you uh, that led to the approval of nintedinib, actually allowed for the inclusion of subjects that did not meet these strict criteria for diagnosis. Um, they allowed for patients that had definite usual interstitial pneumonia on their high resolution CT, so those that did not require lung biopsy by the 2011 guidelines, patients that did not have a definite UIP pattern but did have UIP on their surgical lung biopsy, and they also allowed for patients that had a possible UIP pattern with the addition of traction bronchiectasis without a lung biopsy. So this is a little outside the guidelines that they allowed into this study of patients with IPF. And what they found was um, in a post -hoc, hoc subgroup analysis was that those patients who were entered in the study by those more strict guidelines, so let's just look at the placebo groups first, uh, the honeycomb change or biopsy um, were the solid line, and those who were um, allowed into the study on those less stringent criteria had similar disease progression um, without therapy, but also had similar response to therapy. So interesting, and raises a question about whether at some point in the future we may expand or modify our high resolution CT criteria, and I think we're going to see some changes coming in the next iteration of the ATS guidelines. But what about patients who still need tissue, right? Um, the, uh, we all have patients that are a little too sick or unwilling to undergo a surgical lung biopsy, um, and one option for those patients may be something called a cryobiopsy. Now, transbronchial cryoprobiopsies are performed uh, through a flexible bronchoscope. So uh, the cryoprobe is put down into the uh, lower airways. Uh, froze, a frozen piece of tissue is yanked pretty brutally from the, uh, from the airway. Bronchoscope and all is pulled out and uh, then thawed. And it actually yields a much larger piece of tissue than our transbronchial biopsy. So up to two, sometimes three centimeters. They said that three centimeters is really unusual, but they can get pretty big. Um, it does, and this is a difference pathologically between a biopsy specimen from a cryobiopsy, which again, much larger, but also without the crush artifact that you see in a transbronchial biopsy. And a recent systematic review showed a diagnostic yield in, I, in interstitial lung disease of about 84%. Um, so that's very high, but the jury is still out on this as a, as a diagnostic option for our patients because there is about a 10% rate of pneumothorax. And then when you 
pull the uh, tissue from the airway, you also pull the um, bronchoscope out of the airway, so you lose visualization about what's going on, and you lose the ability to tampon out if there's any bleeding, and there's about a 20% bleeding rate. Um, and that can be pretty significant in patients with compromised lungs to begin with. There are people that will put, um, uh, put a tampon out balloon, like a balloon catheter in place before they pull, they, um, pull the bronchoscope out, and that seems to help. But again, the jury's still out, and this issue is still being studied. So I'm uh, going to switch a little bit here and uh, talk some about uh, technology. So machine learning has an ever-increasing uh, number of applications in our daily life. And although artificial intelligence threatens to uh, make us all obsolete in the future, it has pretty serious potential to aid us in our patient care. So I'm going to show you some data from Verisite's BRAVE studies, which we, we um, have participated and are still participating in. Um, they use transbronchial biopsy specimens in patients who are already undergoing another diagnostic procedure, so a surgical lung biopsy or in some specialized centers, cryobiopsies. And they used a... Um, uh, machine learning and RNA sequencing to generate a genomic classifier and so this um, classifier had a cutoff point and um, they refined their algorithm and then used this, um, used this uh, development set of patients so this would be the patients uh, these are the surgical lung biopsies and this are the these are the classifier results and were able to um, to use that classifier to differentiate between patients with non-UIP biopsies and those with uh, UIP. And then they used a, a second validation set and were able to obtain um, greater than 90% specificity for usual interstitial pneumonia. And this is a test that is um, hopefully going to be FDA approved in the, uh, in the near future. But what if we could get some uh, histopathologic information without actually biopsying the patients? So transbronchial biopsies come with their own risk, right? Um, but uh, this uh, uh, optical coherence tomography is um, is. Uh, a uh, way of providing 3D imaging with microscopic resolution. It has current applications in, uh, in optical uh, technology and in endovascular applications as well as endoscopic uses. And it can get about three millimeters into the tissue that it's next to. But um, in uh, bronchos in endobronchial bronch bronchoscopic use, what they'll do is put a catheter down um, do a circumferential scanning and then do a 10 centimeter pullback and so that actually gets quite a lot larger volume of tissue than in our typical wedge biopsies obtained during a surgical um, procedure and um, is without any actual tissue being obtained. Um, so these are images uh, from uh, Lita Hariri's paper in the Blue Journal earlier this year, and she presented this data at the PFF meeting this weekend. Um, so catheter in the middle of an airway, and um, just looking at the features, if you kind of remember back to the pathology, um, these are honeycomb changes. They were able to differentiate those from traction bronchiectasis, which can be difficult radiographically, but is much easier to do for on a pathologic standpoint, and show so here, spatial heterogeneity with normal alveoli. And these are just some uh, patients from their five patient series that they did showing, again, that they were able to differentiate between honeycomb change, dense fibrosis in the same patient here, so you can see those similar features, and traction bronchiectasis, which looks here much different than the, uh, and is connected to the airway um, than, the, than the honeycomb change. This is the series that they did, and what they, um, they were able to take patients that had non-diagnostic high-resolution CTs, or this person um, who was described as having something a little funny about her, essentially, and they, uh, the providers felt like they needed to move to a surgical lung biopsy because somebody did, something didn't quite seem right about the case, and um, were able to correlate their OCT diagnosis with a surgical lung biopsy very closely in three cases. Um, really, most of these, when they reviewed by five pathologists, were felt like uh, UIP was the diagnosis, and that was the diagnosis made on the OCT. And then they had a concordant diagnosis uh, uh, between the OCT and surgical lung biopsy. This was felt to probably be um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So I've showed you some ways here that, um, that emerging data and some new technologies may alter the approach to how we diagnose IPF. Again, these things are happening, so uh, in the very near future, I think we're going to see some of these, um, these things happen. <laughs>
So changing gears once again, um, the concept of precision medicine holds a lot of opportunity and promise. Uh, the idea here is developing personalized treatments on the basis of genetics and the disease activity in an individual uh, patient. And the aim here is to deliver the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. Uh, and there are already examples of this happening in daily practice in cancer care, HIV, and cystic fibrosis. Although most pulmonologists that don't deal with CF on a daily basis are not as uh, familiar with uh, precision medicine. So uh, one very simple example of an attempt to use precision medicine in IPF is the RAP IPF study, which is ongoing and should have some results by the time of the ATS meeting in the spring. Um, so we do know that uh, gastroesophageal reflux is a very frequent comorbidity in uh, patients with IPF. Up to 90% of IPF patients have, uh, de have uh, detectable reflux if you test them or ask them. 50% uh, of the those don't have typical symptoms of reflux and we would call them silent. Uh, this is a cartoon showing the reflux, so, so uh, you know, uh, mechanism here. So reflux of these gastric juices uh, come up to the thoracic inlet, spill over into the airway and we get microaspiration with recurrent injury over time, aberrant wound healing, which is just pathway toward, uh, to uh, IPF. And um, over time, that leads to pulmonary fibrosis in a susceptible individual. Certainly, lots of people have reflux. And lots of people don't have IPF. Thank goodness. Um, now, there is significant evidence that anti-reflux therapy actually has benefit in IPF. Um, and so this is a study that analyzed the placebo subjects in three large randomized controlled trials. And they looked at their, um, their uh, concomitant medications, uh, looked at patients that were taking PPIs or H2 blockers and those that weren't, and actually found that their uh, lung function declined at a slower rate. And again, not randomized. This is a placebo arm of, of uh, three RCTs. but. Um, um, but there's a signal there that what has been replicated in other non-randomized uh, fashion. This is a case series of uh, four from uh, Ganesh Raghu in Seattle um, that was published in 2006. So this idea has been out there for a while now. Um, and he took three patients with reflux, uh, put them on PPIs, and watched their PFDs stabilize. And then watched two of them when they became non-compliant with their PPIs uh, deteriorate, and then stabilize again when they got back on their PPIs. And then uh, this is another, uh, just a single center experience from Seattle, looking at patients uh, who had anti-reflux surgery uh, that also had IPF. This is the premise for the RAP IPF study, which is a multi-center randomized control trial that's taking patients, again, precision medicine, so patients with IPF that have reflux and randomizing them to uh, a laparoscopic anti-reflux surgery or usual care. And again, those, um, uh, those results should be available in the spring, so it's exciting. When we think of precision medicine, we tend to think of genetics, right? And although commercial genetic testing is kind of all the rage, my mom's about to do it, um, uh, the excitement, I think, in this has kind of outpaced the science. The genetic basis for IPF was first demonstrated in families with uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So familial pulmonary fibrosis is defined by uh, a person with uh, pulmonary fibrosis with a first degree relative that also has, so they only have to have two family members to define familial disease. Um, and, uh, and so studying these families has actually led to the discovery of uh, you know, well over a hundred uh, variants that are rare in the general population, but have a pretty significant penetrance when it comes to the effect size. And those are primarily those that affect uh, alveolar stability, so surfactant protein C and uh, A, and then uh, uh, genes that affect uh, telomere biology, so TERT and TERC being the most common of those. Now the common variants that we know about have been discovered in, gen in uh, genome-wide association studies in patients that have what appears to be sporadic IPF, so only member of a family that has pulmonary fibrosis. And, and this is where we've learned about mach 5 b which is, um, has um, some prognostic implications, uh, as well as TOLIP, which I'll show you may have some uh, treatment implications in the future.
Um, the, uh, so I'm going to ask you to remember back to high school biology um, and think about telomeres for a second because uh, the telomere uh, pathway is the one that is, uh, seems to be most frequently affected, at the very least in familial pulmonary fibrosis, but very frequently in sporadic disease as well. Um, so telomeres, if you remember, are the end caps of our chromosomes that as a cell divides uh, get shorter and telomerase is an en enzyme complex that that just lengthens those telomeres and prevents the shortening as, um, as the cell divides. And as those telomeres get shorter, we see, um, we see evidence of aging. Um, a, a, no, a chromosome with no telomeres can't divide and so dies. And then um, uh, there are mutations of uh, the promoter region of telomerase that um, can cause cell immortality and have been implicated in some cancers. So uh, telomere length, uh, again, as I said, is very uh, is a common implication in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. Up to 40% of patients with familial pulmonary fibrosis, remember two family members, um, ha have short telomeres, so less than ten the 10th percentile, um, but not uh, only, about 20% of those are due to mutations in TERT and TERC that we know about. Um, there are a significant portion of those, so about half, that, uh, that either have a genetic mutation that we haven't yet identified or have epigenetic uh, inheritance of of a short telomere. And there's a similar, similarly about 25% of um, patients with what, we, what appears to be sporadic disease have short telomeres too. So this is a sort of a quintessential uh, aging uh, uh, disease of the lungs. IPF is the most common of the short telomere syndromes when it is, but, um, but we know it uh, uh, plays a role in uh, types of cirrhosis, uh, aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome. So this is a study from uh, families with known uh, telomere pathway mutations, so uh, TERT, TERC, or TELPARN, um, and looking at those patients and their family members who have pulmonary fibrotic disease. Now, I want you just to notice, I'm going to point out one family with a known TERT, muta TERT mutation, um, so telomere re reverse transcriptase, so enzyme, um, the gene that encodes the enzyme, has very specific mutation in multiple family members, but they have very different uh, um, multidisciplinary diagnoses and pathology for the same mutation. And that's true of, um, of uh, multiple families that were studied in this series. Um, in spite of that, telomere-related fibrosis seems to have a uniformly poor, uh, poor prognosis regardless of the pathology. So those patients that I had IPF versus those that had non-IPF fibrosis with a telomere, mut uh, a telomere pathway mutation um, all had a um, poor prognosis in that case. So looking uh, more at what we've learned from familial disease, this is um, from the uh, Vanderbilt cohort of familial disease, which is actually pretty large. Uh, um, this Kropsky paper looked at um, patients that were deemed to be at risk of pulmonary fibrosis, not because they had it, but because they were in a family uh, that had pulmonary fibrosis with or without a known mutation. And so they looked at this at-risk population. They did CT scans. They did biopsies, uh, BAL, uh, genetics, um, and biomarkers. And what they found was that uh, MUC5B, remember this is one of the genes that was discovered in genome-wide association studies, was found in an increase rate in patients that were at risk compared to healthy controls. Similarly, telomere length was a lot shorter than normal controls in patients that were at risk. Again, not patients that had pulmonary fibrosis but had a family member uh, with IPF um, that was deemed to be familiar, so two family members with IPF at least. Um, and some of those, 50% uh, of those had telomeres that were actually very short, um, not just shorter than average. And this is busy, but I want to point out again that this is the same family. They did a, um, uh, 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 looked at multiple risk factors here and found that telomeres, uh, so fractin protein D, MMP7, age, and smoking status um, were all uh, asso significantly associated with um, the risk of having abnormalities in an asymptomatic patient that had family members with IPF that did not have known disease themselves. <laughs> 
So this may be one way, some of these may turn out to be a way to screen patients uh, for pulmonary fibrosis. We think that if we can prevent disease progression, we're way better off because we can't reverse it. And MMP7 has actually been shown in a large population study, the MESA cohort, if anybody's heard of that, sort of like Framingham. Um, uh, a big uh, cardiovascular observational cohort um, to have predictive uh, power in uh, looking for uh, pulmonary fibrosis in patients. So all that's fine and good, but can the genetics inform what we do with these patients? Maybe. Um, if, uh, if I can remind some of you and tell others of you about the Panther IPF study, this was a three-arm study that was done a few years ago looking at what was thought to be standard of care at the time, prednisone, azathioprine, and N-acetylcysteine um, in a randomized fashion versus monotherapy with N-acetylcysteine and placebo. The triple therapy arm, which was thought to be standard of care at the time, was actually stopped early for harm. So Please don't do that. Um, but the NAC and placebo arms would continue to their completion. And uh, when the study was over, actually didn't have any difference um, between n and placebo in terms of their primary endpoint. So it looked like it was probably ineffective. Although, you know, here at the time, well, it's not very expensive. It's over the counter. There's probably no harm to it. Uh, largely, we stopped using it because it didn't, didn't seem to have any utility. So Justin Oldham uh, looked at uh, a subgroup, so post hoc uh, subgroup analysis, and looked at multiple uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms of uh, Tollip as well as MUC5B, and found that this particular exonic SNP of Tollip actually could have um, an implication when it comes to response to NAC. So um, the TT genotype of this, uh, this SNP actually showed uh, probably some benefit with use of NAC. Um, in, uh, in terms of, and this is not uh, survival, and again, these are small numbers, but this is a composite endpoint looking at uh, time to death, hospitalization, transplant, or 10% FEC decline. Um, contrast that with the CT genotype, which showed no difference, and the CC genotype, which actually showed that um, there could be harm associated with NAC. Um, so, uh, so again, thinking about this, um, when you look back at the what appeared to be a negative study and no difference, it was probably driven by the fact that there was some benefit to some people, we just didn't know how to know that, and harm to others. And maybe this isn't as innocuous in the whole population as we would think. Okay, so what about biomarkers? So when I thought of biomarkers uh, in training, I would always think of molecular alphabet soup, right? Um, things that I couldn't remember and we would laugh in conference whenever somebody would talk, like our chief of our division would talk about biomarkers because whoever really does that in pulmonary medicine. But we're actually all very comfortable with physiologic biomarkers. In the ICU, we use vital signs, we use lactate. Um, in, the, in the clinics, we use pulmonary function tests. Those are biomarkers. Um, and in clinical practice, as well as clinical trial endpoints, FVC is used as a biomarker to show uh, disease progression and response to therapy, particularly in IPF. And this is a cartoon of some candidate molecular biomarkers in IPF uh, as they relate to the um, pathogenesis that I'm not going to get into because, again, alphabet soup. But these have the potential to really reshape the approach to IPF, and they have use potentially as screening tools, as I talked about MMP7, diagnostic aids, prognostic indicators, and markers of response to therapy. And this is really the crux of precision medicine. How do we do that? Um, there are some cautionary tales here. So um, there are two studies that were in phase two trials, simtuzumab, and, simtuzumab which is a monoclonal antibody to Loxol 2, and tralokinumab, which is a monoclonal antibody to IL-13, both, uh, both of which are um, part of the fibrotic cascade, um, and utilizing Loxol 2 and periostin, again respectively, in those studies to try and enhance the cohort and, um, and see a difference between those therapies and placebo. And both studies were stopped early and these drugs have gone by the wayside very recently. So these two articles I think are actually just in press. So think, we think that again, we don't have necessarily the right, uh, the right um, 
biomarker. And given the complexity of IPF, it's probably going to take a combination or a panel of biomarkers to really get at this um, issue of prognosis and measuring and so on. This is a scary slide, but this is a 52 gene risk profile, so a, a biomarker that was uh, shown to be able to predict uh, progression of disease in IPF and replicated in six different cohorts, Yale, Imperial College, Chicago Pitt, uh, uh, Brigham and Women's, and uh, Freeburg. So, um, so it's going to change gears a little bit more. So leaving biomarkers, and I think this is probably, besides the optical coherence to, uh, tomography, the coolest thing in this slide set. Uh, so pulmospheres. Um, this is a real example of precision medicine at work. Pulmospheres are 3D structures that are cultured from lung tissue. So, uh, so to date, surgical lung biopsy tissue. Uh, they contain multiple cell types and extracellular matrix, and uh, basically all the components of a lung in a little tiny sphere. And they can develop in under 24 hours. Um, and essentially, it's a microcosm of an actual patient's lung, okay, and their lung biology. So Vina Antony uh, created pulmospheres from 20 IPF patients and uh, non, nine non-IPF controls and showed that uh, the invasiveness of fibroblasts, they measured it um, in a very specific way, and I'm not going to get into that, but uh, could correlate with the clinical progression of a patient. Um, they also showed that when they tested and incubated those pulmospheres with the two antifibrotic drugs, that they could predict response to that therapy. So um, currently, the way we uh, decide which patient gets which drug is on the basis of patient preference and any contraindication. But in the future, perhaps we'll have a pulmosphere for a patient and say, okay, uh, I'm going to take this pulmosphere from your biopsy, test it against nintetinib and perfenidone, um, or whatever other drug may be on the market at the time, tell you when you come back in 48 hours which is the best drug for you and which you respond best to. Um, and this testing could be complete, as I said, by, by 48 hours. So this not only has the potential to really inform our therapeutic interventions, but also for a high throughput screening pr uh, process for new compounds that are in development and may actually be better than our bleomycin mouse model, which is not great. So I'm going to talk a little bit now, finally, on, on some of the new therapies that are in development. Um, this is a, um, just an overwhelming, intentionally so, list of uh, compounds that have been in development recently. Our profenadone and nintetinib that um, have positive results and are on the market. Uh, those in red that had negative results and have fallen by the wayside. Uh, those in yellow that are pending and the greens that are ongoing. Um, I could talk about any one or multiple of these individual compounds, but I probably would have talked about something like simtuzumab or, tri simtuzumab or tralecanumab and been wrong about it, so I'm not going to do that now. What I am going to talk to you about is um, two really cool studies um, for their, uh, just for the premise and uh, understanding some of the biology of IPF. So the lung microbiome is a complex variety of microbes in the lower respiratory tract. And even if a patient is culture negative, the bacterial load in the lungs can be quantified using uh, bacterial DNA from a BAL. Um, studies of the microbiome in IPF have showed actually increased uh, bacterial load in patients with stable IPF versus healthy controls and COPD patients. And in those patients who have stable IPF versus those who uh, have an acute exacerbation of IPF, they have an increase even further in their bacterial load as well as a shift in the, um, in the bacteria present in the composition of the microbi microbiome during that acute exacerbation. So this has led to uh, a study called Cleanup IPF. Um, it's almost fully enrolled, so um, probably looking at results of that sometime next year. And what they're doing is randomizing patients with IPF um, to, uh, to antibiotic therapy versus placebo. Um, uh, on the premise that, that this microbiome and the fact that it changes in acute exacerbation and is different than those patients that are healthy or have other types of lung diseases may contribute to the progression of disease. 
And finally, another exciting therapeutic possibility is the application of cell-based therapies or stem cells. But before I get too into it, I want to give everybody here a word of caution. I'm hoping that none of you are IPF patients, um, but uh, the science is early, and these stem cell therapies are being offered to very desperate patients. And when I say therapies, I'm going to use finger quotes. Um, if you Google IPF, the Lung Institute is one of the top hits that comes up. And the Lung Institute, as well as other um, stem cell therapy offering uh, um, entities are um, doing, uh, are, are again offering uh, stem cell therapies to desperate patients. They are unproven, unregulated, out of pocket, outside of controlled clinical trials, and in some instances have been fatal. The FDA is probably going to be cracking down on some of this, um, but it is predatory and it is fraudulent, and if you hear a patient saying they're going to do it, please try and deter them from doing so. But let's talk now about the real science. So how would stem cells work in IPF? Um, they don't quite grow new lungs, um, but delivered IV, those uh, st stem cells, and there are multiple sources of these stem cells, would uh, circulate to the site of injury, use paracrine signaling uh, to uh, direct some differentiation and activation of resident stem cells, um, recruitment of uh, circulating stem cells, uh, they halt the fibrotic pathways, and they engage in lung repair. And we know that those stem cells that are administered IV actually don't stay in the lungs. Within 24 hours, they show up in the liver. So they're dropping something off, having their effect, and then moving on. Uh, this is a very early mouse model. In young mice, uh, the administration of mesenchymal stem cells, uh, and this is our bleomycin mouse model. So mouse given bleomycin uh, is about the best animal model we have for IPF. Um, but uh, so this is a control young mouse. This is a mouse, a young mouse given bleomycin. And this is a, a, a mouse given bleomycin as well as mesenchymal stem cells. And it attenuated and prevented the fibrosis that happened with the administration of bleomycin. Uh, and this is in old mice, so administration of, uh, this is a control of saline, this is uh, older mice given bleomycin, so exuberant uh, fibrotic response. This is uh, an older mouse given bleomycin plus young stem cells, so uh, stem, uh, uh, not old, so the, I think old in this case, 22 months. Um, and this is bleomycin, uh, a bleomycin mouse given old stem cells. The young stem cells could attenuate and prevent the fibrosis, the old stem cells could not. And this is a human study. So uh, this is a very small uh, phase one study by Marilyn Glassberg in Miami. Um, she, the ether study that was a, just a dose escalation safety study of administration of escalating doses of mesenchymal stem cells in patients with IPF. Was, they were demonstrated to be very safe. Um, and then these are just exploratory endpoints. But this, again, small numbers, not power to show any difference in no placebo, but it leaves us the basis for additional uh, probably phase two studies um, pending funding. And just finally, I want to give some thoughts on trial design as we're moving forward. Uh, the world of IPF trials got a bit more complicated when we went from having no therapies to having two available therapies that changed the disease course. Um, and so uh, the challenges moving forward are that uh, this is a rare disease. We have a rare population of patients, and there are a lot of, uh, of of studies going on. This is from PubMed just a few days ago looking at therapeutic interventions in IPF. Uh, the disease course is unpredictable and non-linear, so, um, so sometimes it's hard to tell what you've done uh, with patients. Uh, we rely currently on physiologic biomarkers and endpoints, although we, there is a lot of interest in utilizing molecular biomarkers. And now there's, uh, since 2014, wide use of, wide use of disease modifying therapy, and so um, uh, trials that were in progress when those two therapies became available had to be revamped to allow uh, background therapy um, for ethical purposes. So just some considerations as we move forward in this world of clinical trials is uh, creating a coordinated clinical trial network. We're part of that with the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation and are um, enrolling patients in the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation registry uh, using uh, uh, Bi molecular biomarker endpoints for preclinical testing as well as early phase to try and decide early whether these drugs are going to work or not before we waste patients uh, on a phase three study. Uh, enriching the patient population for responders. So the next study of NAC is going to be looking at patients that have the TT uh, SNP for um, 
uh, for Tollip, and those patients we expect to have that response and we won't be testing people that don't. Um, enhancing endpoints by possibly using instead of just FVC, composite endpoints that might show a difference earlier or with fewer patients. Um, changing perhaps our inclusion and exclusion criteria. So when we talked about the impulsive studies and, and uh, changing our definition of what is UIP and allowing um, perhaps different, a uh, little bit different phenotypes into these studies because their prognosis seems to be the same. Um, waiver of informed consent is an interesting uh, concept that's been used in some um, and some critical care studies and uh, increased enrollment in those. And then at, uh, how are we potentially going to redefine what is IPF in the future? Um, perhaps we have phenotyped this disease to death and those patients, uh, rather than uh, clinical phenotype, we need to use a genetic uh, or genomic fingerprint, uh, fibrosis scores to determine what's going to happen to these patients as opposed to um, simply their uh, morphology. So I hope what I've given you now is a sense of direction uh, and where the science is headed. Some ideas that there are lots of opportunities ahead and, uh, and a chance to ask any questions if you have them. Keep breathing, keep streaming, and keep reading.